presence of our Lord. Welcome to the service. And to those watching online, welcome to the service as well. This week may have been a great week for some of us, but to some of us, maybe it's not so great. David the Psalm, Psalmist in Psalms uh, 27 says, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. So indeed, David knows very well that despite the challenges that he is facing, there is one thing, one thing, that not only he asks for of the Lord, but he will seek after, that he may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of his temple. So no matter how impossible the situations may seem, we know that we will find our peace and answers in the presence of the Lord in his house. Amen? So let us pray and commit this service to the Lord. Hallelujah. Father God, thank you for the week that you have given to us. Thank you for bringing us back to your house. As we know, in your house, we can find peace, joy, and assurance that we are your children. And if you are for us, Lord, nothing too difficult that may be against us that we cannot handle. So Lord, we just commit the service into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated to the right hand of the Father, or what might be. For there, He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's give God a shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give God a big hand. Hallelujah.
because, because you are good, and I shout because you are good, you are good to me, and I say because you are good. went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were, were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus, you are our Savior. We praise you. We worship you. Jesus, beautiful Savior, God of all majesty.
This is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirits of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite.
Jolin was saying that how God who, sit, who dwells in the high places is also dwelling with the one that is contrite. The picture that came to my mind is Jesus who went to the cross and on the cross there was an inscription over his head that says in Greek, Latin and Hebrew this is the King of the Jews. That our King, when He was on the cross, willingly allow our sin and the people around to nail Him, to restrict His movement. The Bible says that they divided His garments and they cast lots. They sneered at Him and considered that He was one that was rejected by God. That He was a sinner Himself. But Jesus did all that so that we could we could identify. He could identify with our own weaknesses and that we can, through His own death and resurrection, participate in what God has installed for us. To give us this new hope that even when we are rejected, we are sinners or we have been sneered, that we are living in a lowly place. But when Christ rose from the dead, we can rise together with Him. That's the greatness of our God, that He did not just dwell in the high place, but He came down to be with us, to identify with our own weaknesses, our frailty, our rejection, our shame. And then God says, I want you to know that I love you and I'm near you. Father, we come before you today. Lord, we just come with our brokenness and being contrite and our humility. And we ask, oh Lord, come by your power, come by your spirit, come, Lord, through your word to speak to us to lift us out of the situation that we are in. Your Word is, has creative power. Your Word gives life and light. So help us, O oh God, for Your Word to be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And then, Lord Jesus, strengthen us, especially those of us who are, who are going through challenges in our life. Strengthen us by Your Word. Comfort us by Your Spirit and Your presence. We love You and we thank You, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen, Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand today, shall we? Hallelujah. Amen, 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 Amen. Amen, Amen. Praise the Lord. Come, before you're seated down, just turn to your neighbor on your left and right and say, Jesus love you and I love you too. Amen. All right, shall we just do that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated down. Thank you so much, singers, musicians. Today we uh, are, are going just a two-piece two band because we... You know, I think you, you understand that Singapore is now going through a COVID wave. So we do have some musicians that are uh, they're not well. And so I think for this period of time, we'll all just be gracious and we just see how uh, we make some uh, minor adjustments along the way. Okay? Now today, I'm ha very happy because uh, we have uh, John. John Lam is going to be sharing the word. And later on, uh, Rick is going to give the announcement. So we, it's, it's all a band of brothers, okay, on the stage today. <laughs> yeah. Um, for those of you who are new in our church, if, uh, I just want you to know that the usher has a small little welcome card for you. Uh, there's a QR code that you can scan. You give us your contact information and we will be able to reach out to you and invite you to join our cell group. Uh, but more importantly, inside this Google form, there are also links to our YouTube channel, our Facebook group, and, and so on and so forth. So um, if, you, if you have not participated or joined our WhatsApp group chat, Okay, you know how to, to contact us. Just get hold of this card, scan the QR code. If you are a friend who brought a new friend, uh, you are a member in our church, you brought a friend, then you help your new friend to collect this card. All right? Now, uh, there's one more thing before I hand the time to Rick to, to, to give the announcement. Uh, a few weeks back, about two weeks back, one of our church members, um, uh, Augustine, and his wife, Cecilia, Augustine's um, father passed away. And so, Augustine, I don't know if you're in the hall. Yeah, Augustine and Cecilia, yeah. We just want to, um, just want to 
as a church, you know, we have this moment of family time. I think it's family time is where I'll set it aside to celebrate a, a, you know, a special occasion or to also uh, remember the loss of a loved one. So maybe I just invite you and Cecilia and your, and your daughter to just stand up. I just say a prayer over you. And church, let's just remember the family in prayer. Father, I just pray for Augustine, Cecilia, and your family. Lord, today we hear that God, you who dwell in a high place, you are also with those who are contrite. May your presence and your spirit, Lord, comfort Augustine and their family. And I just pray, O oh Lord, that during this time of grief, Lord, let them know that your hand is upon the family and that, Lord, you will bring healing, you will bring peace into them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God, we love you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and so after Rick gives the announcement, collects the offering, uh, we will have Adrian to come and read today's scripture. Now we'll be continuing our study in the book of Isaiah. We are going into chapter 58 and 59. Okay, Rick, thanks. Thank you, Pastor. Let's look at this week's announcement. The first one is on the um, Church Retreat 2024. Uh, this will be the first one that we have uh, for the church. So it's happening on the 21st November to 23rd November, two nights. So those of us who have not yet signed up, so please sign up. Um, the next one is on the church-wide Bible study by Dr. Sam Goh, happening on the 26th of June to 29th of June. Uh, where is it happening? It's happening in this place, EAG, Level 3 at the Thanksgiving Hall. Uh, 7.30 p.m. to... 9.30 p.m. from Wednesday to Friday. And for Saturday, will be from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So this will be a 10-session seminar. We will get to see the full picture of uh, God's salvation by walking through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So see you there. So that's all for the announcement. Uh, let's uh, collect uh, God's tithe and offering today. So there are various ways to give, uh, if you can see on the screen, via PayNow, which you can scan the QR code, and via bank transfer or by check as shown on the screen. If you are giving by cash, you can drop your offering in a white offering box near the exit of this hall. I'm just going to wait upon you to prepare to give and scan the QR code. Come, let's pray for the offering. Father God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together today. And Lord, we just thank you that uh, you have given this, us this ability to give back to you. Father, we ask as we give back to you today in our tithe and our offering, we ask that you continue to bless us in all that we do. We ask that you also use this tithe and offering to continue to great, do great works, O oh God, in your kingdom. So Lord, we just commit this offering into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say... Amen. Thank you so much for your giving. Uh, hello, church. So today our scripture reading is from Isaiah 58, verse 1 to verse 7. Okay. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Verse 6, Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? 
Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Can you hear me? Thanks, Adrian. Okay, so thanks, Adrian, for the scripture reading. Um, for those who don't know me very, uh, at all, so my name is John, John Lam. I'm not a full time staff. I'm actually working in Samaritan of Singapore, that's SOS for short. Um, so it is a social service agency that specializes in helping people uh, in suicide prevention. Uh, so that's where I am right now. I'm very happy today to be able to share with you. So today, friends, we are going to be studying um, Isaiah 58 and 59. And the title of the message today is called True Worship. So, but before that, let's have a quick recap over last week, what the Pastor Tan share, right? So Pastor Tan shared basically three things uh, from Isaiah 57 and not. He, he mentioned about that God's grace to forgive is inclusive and it welcomes all people. And then he says that God's God calls us to faithful obedience to his, to his commandments and trust in Him. And then he says that when we live righteously, loving our neighbours, we become a light to the nations. So from the um, last weekend message, he's talking about how God is bringing the, the people of Israel now from out of the exile, and now they want them to become a light to the nation. He's basically asking the Israelites to fulfil the mission that God has placed for them. So for today in Isaiah 50, uh, the outline for 58, 59 is this, right? We're going to be looking from verse 1 to 12. That's about fasting. Then we're going to look at Sabbath. And then we're going to talk about what, the, what I termed the people's failure. And finally, the arm of the Lord. So what is true worship? And that is found in, we're going to start off with Isaiah 58, verse 1 to 14. So Isaiah 1 to 14 is talking about fasting. And, well, you know, it, to start off with fasting, a little bit difficult for me to talk about fasting because I just was at the lobby, ground floor, and then we were having refreshments. So I was eating pulled pork and sausages and drinking gourmet coffee. So it wasn't exactly like I'm preparing fasting to talk about this, you know. But it's, it's how it is like nowadays in modern uh, Christian circles. Fasting may not be so um, prevalent as before. But, but nevertheless, Fasting is about, uh, uh, it's some, it's about the mindset of our Christian practices, you see. So, some context about fasting in Isaiah 58. So, the people of Israel has already, this is the, what we call the post exilic period, meaning the Israelites were now in the, are back in the land. And they understood that, that in the past, it was because of the idolatry and their sin that they were being exiled. And now they know that they, should not, they are supposed to relinquish the idolatry and come back to God. And now they are looking to God to give them a new life. And so they, they, started to be, to, to, they started to practice fasting. But the problem was that they were fasting, but God was not responding to them. That was not what they were looking for. They thought if they fast, God will do something for them, you see. And, and that's found, if you see Isaiah 58 verse 3, he says here, that why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take knowledge of it? It was something that was, they were taken aback. They thought because fasting was something they were doing uh, in the days before the exile. They thought that if I were to do back the same thing and I were to go back to the same practice that our, our forefathers did and I fast, then God will respond to me. So they went back to, and now they're back in the land and they were practicing what their forefathers was doing. But somehow, God wasn't responding to them. They were puzzled. They were, they were concerned, like, why? And, and they cried out, why are you not responding to us? Well, friends, there's a reason for it. Fasting is not the problem. They were actually using fasting as a, as a religious activity to manipulate God. It was a form of godliness, but it's denying its power. It was a form versus substance. It was a fasting to them was afflicting myself. Afflicting myself thinking that 
then God will respond. But they were afflicting themselves, but there was no repentance in their own lives. <clears throat> so, fasting, what was supposed to be a true fasting, turns out becoming a form of religious activity because they wanted something from God, you see. So how does that apply to us in modern times? For example, we could be very faithful in attending to service. And sometimes we could also be serving, right? So, you know, serving, like for example, in the worship team is a great thing. But as we serve and we worship, we also got to be mindful that whenever we are up here worshipping and leading people, we are doing this for what? To worship God and to, to serve the people. It's never about the team, about how good we are, how perfect is our melody, how good is our vocals, how are we following the keys or not. That's not what it is about. It's not about being better than another team. And I said, refreshments is great. To me, the, the, one of the reasons why we had refreshments at 4 o'clock downstairs whenever possible is because we wanted to have a time for people to come together to, to have fellowship and, and get themselves ready before they come out for service. For me, that's what I come for. And I'd be perfectly happy if, if I went down and then there was just only serving coffee and maybe just sandwiches. You know? It is not about trying to outdo ourselves and well, today is like the gourmet. You know? We love it. And like I say, I, I have my own feel. I, you know, James was with me and we were trying to stop ourselves from eating up everything first. You know? But the point is, 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 we are not doing this as a, a way to, um, to show to, for ourselves. See? Fasting is about, uh, it's about others. It's about serving God. So what is true fasting, friends? True fasting is in verse 6, 58 verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Is this not the fast that I choose? To lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. What is, what is true fasting? True fasting is about God wanting true belief with right practice. Yes, you may believe in, in, in God. You, you may believe that you want God to bless you, but it's also about the right kind of practices. Because they were practicing, they thinking that fasting is this kind of practice. It's about afflicting themselves. But that's not what it is. As what we just read, fasting here, as prophesied by Isaiah, is about helping the poor, feeding the hungry, doing social justice, setting the oppressed free. That is the right practice of true worship. That is the practice of true worship. So like I said, the question is, then what is the kind of practice for, to demonstrate our righteousness? I think to understand that, before we, un we, we answer that question, we've got to then understand what is the reality that we face. You see. And with that, I want to introduce you to the concept of what I call the single perspective. Right? Single perspective means, and I quote from uh, Hans Rosling, who is the best-selling uh, author of the book Factfulness. He said in single factfulness, single perspective is this, forming your worldview by relying on the media will be like forming your view about me by only looking at the picture of my foot. So in other words, when you want to know reality, you need to look at it from few angles because when you look at one angle, you don't see the full picture. You don't, for those of you who are driving, it's like looking at a side mirror. And you only see one part, but then the truth is what is in front is more important. So for us to have the right practice, we need to understand what is the world reality because our individual reality and the world reality could be very different. So let's take some, some examples. The reality in Singapore is that Christian population is about 20%. 20% of Singapore, Singaporeans are Christian. And we'll say that's great. Great progress has been done in evangelism. But actually, in, the, in our neighboring countries, things are not so rosy. Indonesia, Christianity is the second largest religion, but it's only 12%. In Vietnam, 9%. And in Cambodia, 2.8%. So friends, that means when we talk about evangelism and mission, there is still a world out there in, in the area around us that still needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, you see. And sometimes we say, you know, in, in Singapore, as we go into the economy, our mindset is that meritocracy, right, is sufficient to be comfortable. Meaning if you work hard, you're capable, 
you should be able to take care of yourself. It means based on what you do, you will be able to get what you need. But that's not exactly true. Uh, Banerjee, Banerjee and Duflo, who won the uh, Nobel Prize for Economics, they themselves said that people are left behind by development and the ballooning inequality. Means by the fact that the economy is prospering, what is happening in the world is there is a group of people that are left behind. And you know, friends, this is what we call income inequality. There are people in the world, so it's not automatic that just because you work hard, that there are people who that you'll be well. So in other words, if you turn this around, when you see someone that's not doing well, don't in your reality think, that, oh, just because these guys never work hard enough, they never study hard enough, they never try. That's not true. Those of you who are in social work, you will understand a lot of things is a systemic problem. Their own environment is, is causing them to have the disadvantage that they cannot get out of themselves. You see. So in our reality, we often talk about, oh, to me, my struggle is that I don't have enough to have my dream travel holiday. To me, that is my, my problem statement, my struggles. But do you know, um, there was a recent study by Professor Ng Kok Ho who, uh, from NUS. He, he did a study that's called uh, Addressing uh, Basic Household Needs in Singapore. And in his report, he, they discovered that around 30% of all working households earn less than the amount required for basic needs. 30%. 30% of people here in household don't have enough to meet their own basic needs. To them, their reality is very different from our reality. Our challenges are not the same kind of challenges that they have. 30% here in Singapore. So we say for ourselves, you know, that I'm so tired, so exhausted because I've got to take care of my family pet, go to bed and walk there. I'm so exhausted, you know. But do you know, right even in our midst, in our own congreg congregation, we have an elderly couple who has a... Uh, adult son who is who suffers from uh, muscular dystrophy, which means that he basically is wheelchair bound. For them, reality for them is that it's a challenge for the parents because they are older to even, you know, bathe the, their own son. On a daily basis, it's a challenge for them, and because of the economic status, they are, they, are, they they are not able to afford the caregiver to help them. Their world reality is vastly different from the one that we face, you see. Sometimes our reality is what? When we go to work, maybe tomorrow, the blue Monday, as well as tomorrow, Monday, right? Then you say, I'm so upset and distressed because my boss is not recognizing my work. It's so unfair, you know? So unfair. That, you know, I, I, I hate it. I come to work every day and I, all my boss is, I try to do this, but he never recognized my work. He always talk about my the other colleague. It's true, maybe that's your reality. But you know, I've, in my work, come across a woman who was suffering from schizophrenia. For her, every day is a mental torture. Every day is a distress. Every day is for her to cope, to stay alive. And in fact, one day she couldn't cope, and she killed herself by suicide. So friends, even as we sit here, our reality and the world's reality are vastly different. If we were to look at a single perspective and just look with our own lens, then we will fail to see that what is God looking out for? God's worldview is definitely the entire world. He sees things that sometimes we fail to see. That's why when the Israelites were saying, we are fasting, why are you not responding to us? And he says, it's because you are not seeing what I'm seeing. You're not doing what I want you to do, which is to feed the hungry, you know? Help the poor, set the oppressed free, you see. That's why in Micah 6 verse 8, it says the same thing. In Micah 6 verse 8, it says, He has told you, O man, what is good. That's God, right? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. So friends, true belief requires true practice. And when you do that, then Isaiah 58 verse 8 comes to you. In 58 verse 8 it says, Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall, break, shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. When they say your righteousness shall go before you, it means that God is going to put His righteousness on you. Because you, you are demonstrating 
your, your righteousness with the kind of behavior that God wants, you see. So that is true fasting. And that's what I want to say is this. In the, in the next slide, it says, true worshippers of God are not those who immerse themselves in rituals of righteousness. But the true worshippers are those who demonstrate the righteousness of God in their ethical behavior. There's a need for us to demonstrate our righteousness in our behavior. See. And it's then when the grace from God will flow out from us. That, friends, is true fasting. That is part of true worship. And so with that, I'm going to talk about the next point. It's about true Sabbath. That's in 58 verse 13 to 14. So let's just read the, uh, verse 13 first. He says, If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly. Now it seems quite uh, odd to talk about, about this, because in the earlier verses, Isaiah is saying, you basically shouldn't fast or rather you shouldn't fast in this manner. But then now he's telling the people that actually you should be taking your Sabbath because they are not, they seem to be not taking their Sabbath. So it's a little bit odd, but but how they're connected is that because both of them are actually in a way, it's a form of religious activity. They're connected because both activities is meant for us to serve him. It's meant for others. Both uh, fasting, and Sabbath is a form of worship. And that's why Isaiah went for fasting and then he talked about Sabbath because both of them is going to be talking about true worship, you see. So how is that so? Well, basically, if you read verse 13, the interpretation is this, you see, that Sabbath is not just about going to a temple or to church. Because if you look at the entire chapter 58, it actually never talked about going to a temple or church. But rather, Sabbath is about a, a, a way of life that pleases God, that is faithful, trusting, quiet. It is in contrast to the kind of frenetic lifestyle, uh, the frenetic self-serving lifestyle that, especially in Singapore, we are very used to. You see. So therefore, the two key themes in, 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 in about Sabbath, the key themes about observing the Sabbath is this, is to honour God and not seeking your own pleasure, you see. That is what Sabbath is about. So, how do you apply this in, modern, in our modern society? To, to, to keep the Sabbath, to honour God, it also means that you basically don't work yourself to death, you know, at work. Huh? You know, your life is, doesn't consist of working every day to the extent I know we work because we have many kinds of uh, goals and aspiration. One, we also know about the demand that, that we have. But we must still hold on to, to the word. Honouring God is, uh, is actually a non-negotiable part of our lifestyle. Working hard is, is, is a choice by us. I mean, I've been working for a long time. I know what it means to work hard. I know what it means to drive yourself to succeed and to climb the career weather or to do well in your business. I've actually done all those things. But I come to the conclusion actually now in this stage of my life is that the, the choices you make are yours. It, it's, it's, it, we are the one who chooses to run this life. There's only a small uh, sector of people that doesn't apply. And when I talk about those sector of people, they're probably the, the group of people that was mentioned just now, like, those people who can't even meet your basic needs. For them, working is not an option. They have no choice. They will have to work because for them, it's about really you know what they call hand to mouth. Those group of people, yes, I can understand. I've seen people who come from dysfunctional family and for them, they have no choice because they are the only ones supporting their household. But putting aside that group of people, uh, that social economic status people, the vast majority of us actually have a choice in our life that you can honour God with your lifestyle. You do not have to work yourself to death in your work. It's really a choice when you come to think about it. In fact, now that I, I, I'm a bit older now, and I look back, I honestly tell myself, maybe one choice I could have done better was to have spent more time uh, observing the Sabbath, meaning honour God and also, you know, spending more time taking care of my family. 
So it is about honouring God. It's not, you can trust Him. You can trust Him. The other thing about Sabbath, it also means that you don't have to spend your whole Sabbath. Sabbath is rest, right? You don't have to spend the whole Sabbath on what you call lifestyle pursuits. I mean, like, friends, how many, how many holidays you want to go? How many spas are you going to take? How many dinners? How many nights out? You know? How, how many is enough for you to have a rest? I don't know how many times my colleagues come back from Japan, from Taiwan. You know what, what's the most common thing? Oh, don't raise your hand if you want that. Say, say, I'm so tired from my holiday. I need another holiday. Yeah? <laughs> like, why do you do this yourself? You know? <laughs> um, but in a way, it's so hard. So, in other words, what of wisdom? There's, in terms of rest for yourself, in terms of leisure pursuit, I, I'm, I'm one to believe that you should learn to really set boundaries, enjoy your time with friends, with family, with your family pets. But you, you, there's, there's one, at one stage, enough is enough. Huh? Any more won't change your life. Nothing will change if you continue to sleep more, if you continue to go more holidays. Nothing will change. I can tell you this, it's true. Maybe you don't believe me, but I do have friends who are a bit better well off. And they spend their life traveling. Yeah. They just travel, all, but then they come back, they still tell me the same problem. Right? There's, there's no rest one. There's no rest for the weary in this case. So, Sabbath is not about that. At some stage, you could ask yourself, for our application, Sabbath is about honoring God. And, like what the earlier part of the passage, is about serving others. It's about serving others, and we'll touch a bit more about that. So with that, friends, I'm going to move on to chapter 59, because it's quite a long passage, right? So I'm just going to touch on briefly. In chapter 59, verse 1 to 15, right? If you go back and read, if you read the full text of 1 to 15, it's not very pleasant. So I'm just going to read for you too. Right? Verse 2, uh, 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He does not hear. And in verse 9, he says, Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold, darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. So friends, here Isaiah is like 58, telling, Isaiah is telling the people, you know, true worship is this. Fast, fasting is about this way. You fast for the poor, fast for the needy. You need to observe the Sabbath. Because Sabbath is about honouring God and about, about um, serving others. So when, if they believe 58, then why they jump to 59? 59 is for people who then say, okay, I believe that, I understand that, so I will want to do it. But then frustration comes when we, they try and somehow it is still not happening. They are, they are, it is still uh, fruitless. Why is that so? That's why verse 1 to 15 say it's a people's failure. When I say the people's failure, it's a failure because it, we, are own, we are accountable for ourselves, meaning it is my sin, for we are sinful. It's my sin that's causing me to have this, as, the, as, the, as verse 2 say, a separation between God and me. So friends, as much as we try, it is true, sometimes we struggle. Don't you find, like, there in, this, in this place here, there are many Great people here who serve day and I mean not day and night. Lah. Come to service, you serve, Ministry of Help, Visual Call, Ushers, Greeters, you know, the the worship people. You serve and you think that I'm doing my best. But then why sometimes I find I'm still struggling and having challenges? In a way, you can't be blamed. It's a it's a it's a world's problem, meaning we have sinned by our own righteousness, by our own, by our own strength, we are not able to do that. And that's what Isaiah is saying from verse 1 to 15. So, we have to recognize by ourselves we can't do it. And that, friends, bring us to the, the last section, which is in verse 15. 59, 50, verse 15 says, and that's why I, I titled it, say, it is God's action on His people's behalf. Right? God's action on His people. Because we fail and therefore, God has to act for us. So look at verse 16, all right? 59 verse 16, it says, He saw there was no man, and wondered, he as in God, right? And wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. So when you try, 
when you try to do good, God sees. And God don't just see the fact that you try. God also sees your struggle and He understands your weakness. He knows. I think one of the most comforting things I have about our faith is that we are not worshipping a God that just demands that you serve Him, demands that you worship Him, demands that you do this and do that for Him. Faith is this. That, I mean, if you look at other faith, other faith also teaches you that you should worship the true God. You should also serve the community. And people do. But sometimes what happens when you do that, you find you are struggling because your own sinful nature is a weakness for you. And here to me is, 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 the, is the difference. It's like verse 16 says, God sees. He sees it. He understands. He knows you will struggle. And therefore, he says, and he understands. He said, wonder. He, he, when he said he wondered there was no one to intercede, I mean, God didn't literally have to wonder. Like he knows. But just he's saying that for us. He telling you he knows there is no one else who can be our hero. There's no superhero in this context here. There's no better person to help us. And therefore, his own arm, he says, will be the one for you. He will send the divine warrior who will destroy sin. He, the arm of God, is the one that will defeat the power of sin so that you can fulfill the mission that God has for you. And with that, this is where uh, verse 20 is, is, the, is the solution. In verse 20, it says, And a Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. So a Redeemer will come. The Redeemer will come here. So praise the Lord. Today, as you sit here, you are living in the age where that prophecy is fulfilled. Jesus has come to church, to us, to fulfill the prophecy. So Christ is our Redeemer. He is the Redeemer. He is the arm of the Lord that will come to allow you to have the ability to fulfill His mission. And not only that, besides Christ the Redeemer, there's the Holy Spirit who is our en enabler. See? And that's in verse 21. Right? Holy Spirit our enabler. And I think this is the last verse for tonight. He says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth and out of your mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and evermore. So God cleanses Israel so that his spirit will be poured upon, upon them and they will speak his word. So friends, Christ our Redeemer came. It's fulfilled in our time. Jesus came to redeem us of our sins. And then because of that, the Holy Spirit is now upon us. Whatever has been asked of us in Isaiah 58, God is saying, He has given Jesus to you and the Holy Spirit is here. You are able to demonstrate your righteousness. You are able to do the works that He is asking for. So with that, I leave you with this question. Then how can we demonstrate our righteousness? Not that we know that true worship is to demonstrate our righteousness in an ethical manner. How can we do that? So remember, right? Single perspective. We, life's problem is fairly complex. So there's no single simple solution. So don't look at the world's problem from one angle only. Yeah, but as long as we are trying, believe that the Lord will give us the grace and believe that the arm of the Lord, you know, will make a difference. So how can we demonstrate our righteousness? Well, friends, so in my line of work, I've, I've, I've seen uh, Christians, uh, for example, philanthropists, right? Uh, philanthropists, people who were giving away their wealth to support, to help the needy. So, and many of them are Christians. So there are wealthy people, they are out here, you know, and they're not, you know, uh, what's the word? They, they're not just bragging about their lifestyle, blogging, about where they're going, what kind of clothes they wear. They're quiet people doing their own quiet thing, giving money away. So I've met Christian philanthropists. I've seen volunteerism, right? Volunteers who will volunteer in different communities to help. Like my own line of work, we have people, volunteers who come and be trained and spend their time manning the hotline to talk to people who are in distress. And many of them are having suicide thoughts. And these are people who volunteer to spend time to really help these people. So, volunteerism 
and I, I've spoken with many of them, and many of them are Christians. I have occasions uh, when things are a bit quiet, I sat down with them and noticed that the Bible was out, they were reading the Bible, and we have some conversations about, about God and so on. There are many Christians are out there volunteering. I met another one, a young man who set up a charity to help youth in crisis. And he set it all by himself, and now he, his team is helping youth who, who are suicidal, and he'll help people who are out in the ledge, and they'll help them all the way to bring them to the hospital. So there are young men, and they are doing this thing because they care for, for the world around them. You know, in our lives, I just mentioned, the world is still out there for us to evangelize. Missions is a way for us to demonstrate our righteousness. Service in church is also another way. Serving God in church is a, a very tangible way of demonstrating our righteousness. And in your own individual lives, you can be serving, you can serving, you can be serving the people around you. Be more aware of the people around us. Make it our lifestyle to really want to help someone. And finally, giving. If you are at a stage of life where you're not able to contribute your time, you can one thing you can do, you can contribute, you can help to give. Give to various needs, give to church. Giving is a big part of, of, of helping people. So in conclusion, just to repeat back, in conclusion, true, true worshippers are those, true worshippers of God are not those who immerse themselves in rituals of righteousness, but they are those who demonstrate the righteousness of God in their ethical behavior. So divine grace enables us to demonstrate this righteousness. And remember, Christ is our Redeemer. He has defeated sin, and the Holy Spirit is poured out to, to, to us so that we become His servants. We become His worshippers. This is the true worship. So I leave you to, today with the reflection question. Two simple one. So the reflection question is this. In my personal lifestyle, I wish you can come up. <laughs> yeah. In my own personal lifestyle, how can I serve and give back to the community and church? Right? How can you serve and give it back? And the second question is this. In what way can I observe my personal Sabbath to honor the Lord? So really, this message is about two things. How can we really give back? How can we serve? And how can, in my own personal time, how can I honor the Lord in the way I, I rest? You know, how can my lifestyle change? So with that, I invite you to stand up and we're just going to say a prayer together as, as we prepare to worship God. Right? Just, just close our eyes and just... And as, as we pray, I just, I just leave to you, I'd like to ask you to meditate and I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you and ask you the same two questions. I, I invite you as we, as we pray that you will allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Maybe some of you have been thinking about what, what else, what can I do in, in MANA? How, what can I do in CGF? What can I do to just play a little part more? And sometimes it's not just about church. Sometimes it's about the places around, the people around us. What can I do to make a difference? I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide you. In, we all have different level of stages in life. Some are new mothers and we totally understand that things are very different. Some are retirees and our stage of life, the time will be different as well. And I also invite you to pray and ask yourself, how, in my own personal time, how can I recalibrate to spend more time with God and honour Him? And I pray that the Holy Spirit will, will be able to speak with you. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are our guide, our comforter. You are our teacher. You show us the way and you are the one that enables us. You are the one who gives us the power to be able to demonstrate our, our righteousness. You are the one that gives us the ability to walk ethically, not, not always for ourselves, but always think about other people. And I pray that you're able to show our friends here what are ways we can walk with you to serve together. And even as we make a choice to pursue that, I pray that you also give us the strength. We know that it's not easy to want to step out a little bit more. 
because all of us have our challenges. And I pray that let us have the faith to believe that it is possible. It is possible to make a difference with the people around us. It is possible for us to make a difference in our church itself. I pray, Lord, that you will give them the grace and the peace when they step out together. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Don, John, for the word. I'm most touched um, in this whole passage when John was talking about, and of course Isaiah here, you can see, that when God says, I wonder that there was no intercessor. And then God says, therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. I think that touches me because God is a God who earlier in Isaiah it says, the people says, when we are fasting, why is it that you do not see? It's as if like, God, are you blind? But then in 59, chapter 59, it does show us that God sees. God sees us. He sees the situation. He knows we are weak. Then He says, I will bring salvation myself. And I'll give you the Holy Spirit to enable you. I think that is how our gospel is. It's not about us if we want to wait for the whole world, for, for us human beings to, to get our acts together, then I think it's going, to be, it's going to be very messy. But if we are able to continue to worship God and trust Him. So maybe we just take this moment as we just sing this song. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, and worship Him. Let that thought of God being our Redeemer, our Enabler through the power of the Holy Spirit, let it sink in our hearts. And then let's avail ourselves as, as John was bringing out this message. Let's avail ourselves to be God's instrument of blessing to the world around us. Amen. Come, let's just worship Him. I sing praises to Your name. Oh Lord, praises to Your can we always remember that God's heart is for the world, for those, for the community that He has put us in. That we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Fasting is not a way to manipulate God, but it's really for you to remember the poor and the needy around you. Sabbath is again not something to you do it so that God can give you favour. But it's a sign of you honouring God, remembering God as first in your life. That you take that time to serve Him and the people that the Lord will have you serve. But do it in a way that is restful. 
God's desire for Israel has not changed in that way. That's why we in the church were called the new Israel. God's desire for us as a church has not changed. So that we can be a blessing to the people around us. And so we thank God that by the grace of God, the love that He has for us, that He gave us Jesus to die on the cross and through His death, die to our old self, our old man. And through His resurrection and His ascension to heaven, enable us by giving us the Holy Spirit so that we can continue to do this work of being a witness to the nations of God's goodness. And we call this, all this whole entire process, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, that you can, that we are now called the covenantal people of God, that you have empowered us to go forth to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Today, through your word, oh God, help us to be able to humbly look at our own condition, our own sin, and our lack and our inadequacy, and confidently look at your grace, your provision for all of us in Jesus Christ. That, Lord, we serve not out of our own strength, but we serve by the power of the Holy Spirit. So bless our church, bless every individual here, O oh God, who has heard this sermon. Renew our mind, adjust, Lord, the thoughts in our, heart, in our mind about true worship and true practice, true ethical behavior. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand one more time. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm glad that uh, John John is the one who shared this message because he's in the he's he's out there doing uh, being very very involved in the social service uh, sector. So I think that's that's very good. And, and by divine appointment, we we planned this a long long time ago that on this weekend he will be sharing. So by divine appointment, he happens to be sharing these two chapters. So praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. Shall we close our time? Uh, today in the service by praying the Lord's Prayer and then let me give you the benediction. Come, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Church, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And as you go forth with the commission from the Lord Jesus to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 So next week, I will continue doing Isaiah. And let, just, let me just uh, tell you that we will probably have at least two or three more weeks and then that's it. By the end of June, we will finish. And then the end of June, we have uh, Pastor David Wong who is going to come and share. It's the last weekend of the, of the month. Then July onwards, we will be going to another book. Okay? So we have this whole half a year, we have journeyed through Isaiah and I have been tremendously blessed by it and I hope that you are as well. So God bless you. Have a peaceful uh, weekend. God bless. <laughs>